Right, I'm going to introduce our next guest speaker, uh, Dr. Tom Sunnick. Uh, he's a former U.S. professor. He's uh, also an author. Some of his books are over there for sale. A little plug for him there. Hope that's okay. Uh, he's, he's a board member of the American Freedom Party, and he's a former Croatian diplomat. So I'd like you to put your hands together, please, for Dr. Tom Sunik. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me well first? Okay. All right. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for being here. It's a very impressive number. And I would like to thank uh, Nick Griffin for his invitation. And, of course, I would like to thank uh, uh, Martin and uh, Mike and uh, Linda, whom I met yesterday. They were very kind and nice people, and they, we discussed about several issues. And I'm very pleased that they, they welcomed me very well yesterday, and they put me up at the nice place down in Chester, a <laughs> nice place. Anyway, I also need to extend my, uh, my best greetings from my friends in the United States of America first, from our little party, American Freedom Party. I don't know if you're familiar with it. This is not going to be my topic this very moment, but later on I can give you some further information about what this party is all about. It's very similar to yours. I got to tell you, in all, uh, with, all, in all, uh, in, with all frankness, that this is not a huge party. It's a small party, although on our board we have some very, very impressive academics, including my friend, Professor Kevin McDonald. I'm sure you're familiar with the name. Virginia Bernetti, she's a famous sociobiologist. And our chairman is William Johnson. He's a prominent lawyer from L.A. So they're all aware that I'm now here. Hopefully they'll also be listening and be watching me. And I would certainly be very pleased to give you some further feedback on what we are doing and what, our, what the situation in the United States of America is all about. Adam told you about my books. Again, you know, everybody has his ID. Some folks like to brag with our Porsches, with our BMUs, their cars. I don't have any of it, and I'm not even interested in it. I could have had some of those things. But I'm more interested in books and in translations. So I'm quite happy if, I, if you're interested in some good prose, not necessarily on race, not necessarily on immigration, but if you guys read uh, Carlyle or, for that matter, Shakespeare, or if you guys are familiar a little bit with Quincy and his uh, monologues, I certainly would be very pleased to engage you in that type of discussion. And usually I need to tell you that I'm, I'm digressing a little bit. Our party politics, and not just the BNP party politics, but for that matter, my friends from the NPD in Germany or Front National in France, where I'm quite often, due to my language skills, i got to tell you that, uh, we got to focus ourselves, uh, our attention, more on this cultural level. What I mean by culture is not necessarily going to Madame Tussauds Museum or checking out the nice bridge over at uh, the, uh, in, in London, but also promoting ourselves and, and showing our, our enemies, our detractors, that we have a huge baggage, a huge baggage of whatever you want to call it, nationalist or right-wing or, or conservative, uh, conservative thought. And this is something we've got to be proud of, and I am quite proud of it. And to some extent, most of my books deal with our conservative heritage or whatever. I hate using this word conservative because, again, ladies and gentlemen, including this word balkanization, all those words, all those concepts, even those that you hear from the BBC have been subject to what? To semantic distortions. They're the ones who manipulate the meaning of those words. So when somebody starts telling me about diversity, I freak out. When somebody starts telling me about democracy, I freak out. And who is talking about democracy? What does that mean, democracy? I am privileged enough to talk about democracy because I lived in communist Yugoslavia. I was born there until the age of 20. I lived there. So the word uh, democracy was regurgitated by party apparatchiks on all wavelengths. When I came to the glorious west of the United States of America, I'm also a U.S. citizen, i got to tell you that, then I heard another brand of democracy. So, you know, my eyes and my ears are really stuffed with that. So when somebody starts telling me about diversity, tolerance, democracy, I first need to know exactly who is the person who is using those words. So you don't have to be big linguists like I am or have big background, whatever, in philosophy or literature, but be always suspicious. 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis your interlocutor, regardless whether this is a man from the BBC or even or CNN or Fox News, all those guys, I know some of them as a former diplomat. I'll tell you, folks, I'm not going to mention some of their names. In private, they're extremely kind people, and they will nod you and tell you, Tom, you're so beautiful, you're excellent. But in public life, they'll never pop back you up. So this tells you again how their perks and their tenures are far more important than their character. So uh, this is like a sort of introduction, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, I will be here today and, and tomorrow, so I'm more than willing to, to answer some of your questions in private and give you some of my websites or whatever, if, you, if, if I can be of any assistance whatsoever. I'm not here to serve my ego. I, I'm tired of it. I'm, I'm here to help our cause because what actually reunites the BNP with the uh, with the, Europe, with the American Freedom Party is our survival. We are fighting not just for our intellectual survival, but for our biological survival. And we always assume that's a typical, that's a human trait, that somebody else will do it, and that for some reasons things will smooth out in the future. They won't, because I saw it firsthand when the Yugoslavia broke up in 1991. So the former friends became arch enemies, so it can help in overnight. So anyway, let me just briefly, because I understand, folks, there are some nice people here who also have that, that speaking slot, and I wouldn't like to monopolize that time. All the more as I'm going to have tomorrow another important speech on those semantic distortions and or this Orwellian baby talk that people are now using, not just in the East, but, uh, not just in the West, what, in America, in, in the UK, but also now in what they call the new democracies in the East. First, the term balkanization, I'm sure you are familiar with that. It's being used now quite often even in the United States of America. Pat Buchanan, I think he wrote a, a, in one of his late, late, latest books, he, he uses this word, the balkanization of the United States of America. For that matter, if you're somewhat familiar with uh, South Africa, if you read the newspapers, well, even Independent and Guardian, you will find once in a while the, the expression, the balkanization of South Africa. I mean, I'm sure you have the vague idea of what balkanization means. It means the country, when it's splitting up, uh, again, to put it somewhat more eloquently, when ethnic borders do not coincide with geographical borders, then you can safely say, well, this country is in the process of becoming balkanized, all right? Now, you probably, I'm sure the Englishmen are certainly more aware of that than possibly, let's say, the French or possibly other people because, of course, they're the, the Irish here next door. So, of course, the, the, the English and the Irish conflict, believe it or not, from the American perspective or from the perspective of somebody observing from the moon, it's, it's simply incomprehensible. For me, this is quite comprehensible because I come. I was born in the area where those ethnic conflicts were quite extreme. So under no circumstances, ladies and gentlemen, this is my first conclusion, first main point I want to make, regardless of how much we are being swamped by non-European immigration, regardless of how much the United States has completely changed its racial and its, its demographic profile, I'm digressing just to give you an idea. Out of 310 million American residents or citizens, whatever you want to call them, over one-third, 110 million are of non-European ancestry. And here I'm not counting those, <coughs> excuse me, uh, um, Arab Americans and Jewish Americans. There's about 12 million now. There were 7 million Muslim Americans, approximately. These are, these are the polls, the, uh, the official polls, at about 6 million Jewish Americans, because they, because they fit into the official category of white or Caucasian Americans. So please do be very careful with those numbers. But over one-third, if not even more, of American residents are of non-European ancestry. So again, this word, the balkanization of America, is not a threatening word. It's not a hate speech. It's just a fact of the matter, which even... Uh, 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 newspapers, uh, official mainstream newspapers like the New York Times, the Washington Post, let alone other media outlets are talking about. Well, nobody wants actually to, to uh, invoke this uh, end, end, uh, end of the world scenario, but this is a very, very real thing. Most likely you will find the real truth of the matter when you talk with some high public officials in the States in private, not in public. In public they will probably 
lot and they will make eulogies about this multicultural system, how well it needs to function, and so on and so forth. Again, let me backpedal. As far as multiculturalism is concerned, I'm just thinking real fast. You remember what Angela Merkel, Angela Merkel, the chancellor, the third time chancellor of the of the of Germany, said last year in Germany. She said literally, I can quote her in German, Multikulturalismus funktioniert gar nicht mehr in Deutschland. Also multiculturalism doesn't function any longer in, in the beer in Germany. What does that mean? Well, she didn't imply that something needs to be changed. She just stated a fact. And the irony is, you know, ladies and gentlemen, again, that those multicultural preachers, they keep telling us, let's have more immigrants come in. We'll get rid of multicultural problems by having more and more non-European immigrants coming into our home countries. This is exactly the scenario I went through, ex-Yugoslavia went through in 1991. Again, one thing I need to, to focus on for a second, ladies and gentlemen, let us distinguish here between ethnic balkanization and racial balkanization. I don't want to get too academic, but these are very, very serious, two important theses, and I'll try to be as brief and as, and as down-to-earth as possible. <coughs> When we talk about the ethnic balkanization, of course, the first case, the, the first uh, image that it comes to mind is this ex-Yugoslavia. How Yugoslavia fell apart, I'm not going to go into details. However, I do not blame the Serbs or the Croats, for that matter. I blame Lord George, if you wish. I blame the Versailles Treaty architects in 1991. They were the ones who crafted this Mickey Mouse state out of nothing, you know. And the results were known twice in the century. First time it didn't work, the second time it didn't work. Now, Ethnic uh, uh, balkanization still exists to some extent. We can trace this also between Northern Ireland or Northern uh, the, uh, the Irish living in Northern Ireland. So let us not downplay that, ladies and gentlemen, because I spoke with some Irish nationalists as well who are very similar to our cause, very very close to our cause. Also Polish nationalists versus the German nationalists. So we are talking about all white nationalism being balkanized in a sense, which is certainly not to our favor which is certainly not fostering our cause. And I would certainly appreciate if Nick Griffin, our, our, our friend and your party chairman, could address this issue even at the European Parliament. Let us not, ladies and gentlemen, bask ourselves in some illusions. Hypothetically, I don't want to sound like a big pessimist like Carlyle or like Schopenhauer, but the fact of the matter is, even if, if this country is completely devoid of... Uh, Non-European immigrants, let's say if 10 million, as of now, there is about 10 million British citizens of non-European immigrant uh, uh, origin, if they were to disappear, if they were to evaporate in the air, we still wouldn't have real serious ethnic problems with the Irish, or for that matter, the Poles would still be fighting a turf war, or what they call the victimhood war with the Germans. And this is something that's, that has been bothering me for quite some time. Again, let me digress, and I hope this ties in well with what Nick Griffin was talking about, and he can tell you best. There is a powerful Hungarian nationalist party, Jobbik. You have heard of Jobbik. They're very good people. They have some top-notch intellectuals, extremely well organized. There is, of course, I know uh, Vice President of uh, Le Front National, uh, Monsieur Saint-Just. Uh, I translated his speech once from French into English. So, okay, <laughs> I did it very well, by the way. I don't know Marine Le very well, but I know her, her, her surrounding very well. And, uh, of course, we have uh, 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 the uh, Flams Belang. I have pretty good ties with them. I would, uh, also with uh, FPO in, in, uh, with Straher down in, in Austria. However, let us also keep in mind that, uh, uh, <coughs> that uh, this, uh, those ethnic issues among us are, are sometimes very, very important. If you talk to a man... I'm just talking from the top of my head, so please do focus for a second. All right. The Hungarian Jobbik Party architects, just as much as they share many things with us, just as much as they, they have the same cultural baggage, the white heritage, there's no question about that. But very often, especially in Eastern Europe, including my country for the time being in Croatia, nationalists, our local white nationalists, frame their national and their racial identity by what? By demonizing the first-door first neighbor. The Romanian nationalists and the Hungarian nationalists do not get along well. The, the Irish nationalists, let's face it, and the British nationalists do not get along well. 
the Polish, well, I'm probably simplifying it because I have no time really now to go into those nitty-gritty details and writing about this quite extensively. Ask yourself a question. Who actually benefits from the Serbian creation conflict? This is the question that needs to be raised. And we know deadly well who benefits in Brussels and in Washington, D.C., or for that matter, on the East Coast, from those internal conflicts between Europeans, be they Irish or Welsh, or be they Walloons or Flemish. They're good people. I admire them. I admire their culture. But at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we simply have no time. We have no biological time left, you know, given our shrinking number to quarrel and to, to about those petty parochial issues, which I hate to say, you know, some, very often those parochial issues are, are, are wrapped up in a cultural uh, discourse, you know, about the language, about the, whether this gentleman was of Polish origin or whether, whether Nietzsche, for instance, was of half Polish, of half, uh, half Slavic origin or of half German origin. But these are very, very important issues, especially among respective nationalists, especially in Eastern Europe. And I hate to say, I'm ashamed to say that I have hard Hard time sometimes bringing up the Serbian nationalists and, and Croatian nationalists together and tell them, folks, please, I understand you have cultural memory. I understand you have painful victimhoods on both sides. But listen, do you guys realize what's going on in Europe? Do you guys realize that this oligarchic superclass, this capitalism, is just devouring us piece by piece? We'll all disappear regardless of the fact that, ironically, Poland today and Croatia today is more European than England and than Blackpool. You can take a walk downtown in Zagreb, you don't see any, any, any non-Europeans. It's all white. And yet, again, I, I need to recap that. It really pains me. Many Croatian nationalists that I know of, including Hungarian nationalists, they solely base their national consciousness, their national racial awareness, on the exclusion of the first-door neighbor. Well, you've got more important things. Well, just take a walk to the, as I call it, Parisian suburbs or Parisian, I call it underworld. Take a metro late at night. I mean, you, 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 stare, you don't even know where, where you are. You're in Kinshasa or in Nairobi or in Kenya. You're no longer in Europe. You go to Marseille. I mean, I don't feel like going, even if I had a free ticket now to Marseille or even to London or you know, Croydon. What do I, I mean, I got nothing, let alone L.A., folks. I just came back, so I mean, I'm not very much tempted about this. So my first and basic point is, ladies and gentlemen, I'm particularly appealing to Nick Griffin and to all of you, please reach out your hands to our colleagues, to our comrades, to our friends, to our ladies and gentlemen in Eastern Europe and also in Western Europe, and let's try to overcome, let's try to bridge those old parochial victimhoods, which of course we are not denigrating them. All those people have their cultural memory. We have to respect, we have to learn their languages just like I did. Okay? So I am truly a multicultural in a positive sense. Okay? I'll tell you something in a minute about this misnomer, multiculturalism. We have to bring those people together because we are not many. There are 6-7% of, of Europeans all over the world, and we are, we are on the, in, on increasingly we are becoming a minority. Now, let me back up again, folks. We are often accused of being a racist. Okay, now here I have to make a, a strong point. Of being uh, whatever, racial, uh, of xeno, or whatever, whatever you call it, of suffering from xenophobia, of being chauvinist. I've, I must have heard that millions of times. And also my name sometimes is associated with racism, a racist, white supremacism. Look at this construct, white supremacism. If you look at the etymology of this word, it didn't exist like 40 or 50 years ago. Don't ask me who co coined this, this neologism, it's, <laughs> but it's, it's meaningless, white, white supremacist, Tom Sonic. But if you look carefully, if you are familiar a little bit, let alone those of you who lived in Asia and Africa, I did, I did have a chance to spend a couple of years in Northern Africa as a former diplomat. <clears throat> I tell you, folks, and if you if you meet people here at the grocery stores, the Pakistanis and whatever, talk to them a little bit. You'll see that those folks are have extremely high racial consciousness, much higher than us. They probably don't put it so eloquently in some in some sociobiological language, but they have a strong sense of adherence to their in group. Okay, in group meaning their tribe. Okay, the same thing you will see with the blacks in the United States of America, the same thing you will see with Asians, particularly Asians, of Asians, the, the Japanese, the, especially the Japanese and the Chinese on the West Coast, from Vancouver all the way down to San Diego. You just got to be careful. The best thing is to do if you are a researcher, or even if you're a simple man, just play dumb sometimes, you know, play dumb, play this if you know nothing, or where is China, just ask them some stupid questions, and you'll be able to elicit some very good answers, which will tell you again, 
that we Europeans, we white Europeans, we are the ones who really suffer from pathological guilt feelings. This is our problem, our feelings of guilt. You've got to ask yourself a question. Why do we have those guilt feelings? Why are we wallowing, wallowing in our masochism? What is so wrong with our masochism? Well, you have to ask yourself a question. Who imposed this sense of masochism on us? This, Of course, this is the whole theory that going back to the Second World War, that you have to be ashamed of your quote-unquote colonial past, that I have to be ashamed of our fascist past, that I have to be ashamed briefly of my white past. But ask any black, any guy, any Asian in Africa, uh, in America, or in Europe, he is very proud of who he is. This is, ladies and gentlemen, something that we need to overcome. This is something where we have to tip the balance. Back again, and I have to make some explanatory notes about multiculturalism, another term that I don't like. Why? Because it's a relatively new term. Probably you don't probably realize it actually popped up in Amer on American campuses late in the 70s, multiculturalism. I love multiculturalism because I love culture. And I'm at home in French and in France, and I'm, I'm, well, look, I put years and years of studies in it, so I'll be happy to announce my book's coming now in French shortly. And I had just a speech recently for the old German veterans in Klagenfurt, the big one, and then up in Harz, in the, near in Leipzig, I also had a speech in Germany on race and gestalt, race and identity. So it was very well attended, and I certainly am always happy when I please my crowd. And uh, what I wanted to tell you, there is nothing wrong with multi multiculturalism. Ah, wait a second. Multiculturalism is basically is a euphemism that the BBC and your scribes here in academia and in the independent or whatever journals or the leftist journals use for what? For multiracialism. They are scared of the word race. They don't want to use the word race, hence the reason they prefer this esoteric word multiculturalism. Again, I have nothing against multiculturalism. I lived, my grandparents lived in a multicultural Austro-Hungarian empire. You know, it was a Catholic large empire. There were different cultures, different languages spoken, European languages. It was something really I would encourage all young Brits, you know, to to become acquainted with, with our past, not just with their, all were Cromwell or Charles I, but also with, uh, with uh, Carl, Charles V in, in, uh, from uh, Flanders, and also our kings and, our, and the Polish kings who actually saved Europe from the Turkish onslaught, you know, back in 1683. So this is something all young Brits need to do, not just to go in and party politics, race, and just, this is all good, but we, other than that, we got to do this cultural work. This is what I call true multiculturalism. However, all scribes, and I know quite a few of them as a former professor back in California, leftist scribes, they're my arch enemies, i got to tell you that. They actually tell us, oh, you guys, uh, you have to use the word, you are racist, uh, you have to live in a multicultural society. Look how actually shallow this sounds. Like, let us just look at the grammatical structure, if I may, okay? Now, the English is your first language. <laughs> I love the English language. Look at this. They call us racist, and yet they say there are no racists. Well, look at this. There is, a, there, is, there, is a, there is something missing. There is a link missing. How can you call somebody a racist if there are no racists? You know? Now, if you have dismissed the, the reality of racists, if you think that race is only a skin deep, which is wrong, after all, you know what's going on. We have the sequencing of genome. Now you can trace, all of you, ladies and gentlemen, all of me, including myself, we can trace our ancestry 40,000 years ago, okay? And we have a clear-cut idea of what race is all about. But no, our friends, our scribes tell us there are, there are no races. And yet they call us racist. It's a shut-up word. Racist, to, be a, to call, calling somebody a racist, mean, meaning to, some, to, to discredit somebody, mean, meaning, uh, look, uh, meaning uh, how can I say, according to somebody, a look of, of an idiot, of a cook or something. <coughs> look, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk uh, uh, real briefly about the United States of America, uh, the country is in the balkanization, this time not along ethnic lines, not be between the Irish or the Italians or the, or the Protestants or the Puritans or whatever you want to call them, but there is a clear-cut uh, fear, all right, if you study the society well, if you travel, not just travel, if you go to the Ozark Mountains, I was just in the Ozark Mountains the other day with some of my friends, very simple people, blue-collar workers, some of them ex-clansmen, whatever, <coughs> And I talk to them. Everybody's afraid, not just for their pension plans, but for this entire. They don't. They don't feel. They don't feel at home. Those people. You know? 
affirmative action has destroyed the country, which again reminds me of what we called back in communist Yugoslavia the quota system. You know, the quota system destroyed Yugoslavia, which meant specifically in the 60s and 70s, it meant that that many people from each ethnic group in communist Yugoslavia had to be popped up and shored up at the government, uh, at the feder the, the federal, uh, on the federal level which in turn ruined the country. And this is exactly now what's happening with this affirmative action terrorism, I'll put it that way. Affirmative action terrorism in academia, especially where the brightest and the finest people of mostly of European origin simply don't, don't, don't fit into this quota. You know, affirmative action, according to the affirmative action, it's a federal law, 30% of places that best universities need to be reserved, need to be put aside for other what they call minorities. But now they are no longer minorities, but majorities anyway. <clears throat> I hope, ladies and gentlemen, you can follow me because this is a huge topic. I'm just giving you a rough idea. The rough idea, again, on the west and the east side of the United States of America, the racial scene has completely changed. From Vancouver all the way down to San Diego, it's 50% Europeans and 50% non-European Americans. On the east coast, the same thing you have from the northern, from Boston, all the way down to, to Charleston and back further to Florida. It's a very mixed type of environment. Now, the middle America is still more or less uh, European, uh, quite traditional, quite, uh, quite uh, uh, well-rooted. And, of course, uh, I'm not going to go now into some big theories, but the fact is that, yes, indeed, there is a great deal of, uh, of talk now, even official talk, of countries, of federal states seceding and creating their own ethnostate. Now, again, I need to tell you that most Americans you meet are certainly not racially uh, uh, versed. They don't use this um, sociobiological language as I might sometimes do. But they certainly, on a, on a, on a how can I say, primordial level, they feel, they feel threatened. Okay? You have heard about flash mobs, you have heard what's going on. Most of it you never hear in the newspapers. But people, yes, indeed, they fear something. Now, just before we, I, I end up and before we, we finish that, ladies and gentlemen, about this end, end day scenario, let's be quite clear about this. I mentioned I was uh, earlier at, at the beginning of my expose that I'm pretty much pessimistic about this all European type of a homeland where, again, we would resort to our ethnic and warfares like the Irish against the English and the Croats against the Serbs or the Poles against the Germans, something we definitely need to, to, to finish once and for all. But let's also keep in mind that, uh, uh, that uh, let's say, hypothetically speaking, there are quite a few of those worst-case uh, worst scenarios. Hypothetically speaking, America is to break up, hypothetically speaking, which it might. Now, do not assume that things will be uh, clear-cut and, and with a, with a clear-cut cleavage between white and black. Wrong, because you'd be surprised to find out how, in fact, there is a great deal of tension between black Americans and Hispanic Americans, or the Asian Americans. For an Asian family, it's, it's considered a crime if a lady m marries a black guy, whereas when she marries a white guy, it's a, a sense of prestige. You see, especially ladies, uh, people coming from southern, southern uh, Asian basin. For the Filipinos ladies, they like marrying in droves to white people because it sort of boosts their prestige a little bit, their racial prestige. Again, nobody wants to mention this word race, but everybody is deadly aware of what his gene pool is all about and how his kids will look like, you know. So there is nothing wrong in staying white. There is nothing wrong in being proud of our white uh, origin and our white, um, uh, how can I say, white ancestry. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to go into details. I understand that there are some more people now coming in, in, uh, to the podium. I certainly, I will, once again, I'd like to repeat, I will be at your service uh, later on this afternoon. Let me just uh, finish up with something that I've witnessed firsthand in the United States, uh, in, 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 uh, well, in, first in, in the United States, now then in, in ex-Yugoslavia. Do not underestimate the system, but please do not overestimate the system, all right? You remember in 1888, there was a big uh, parade, a military parade in Dresden going on. Honecker was there, all those big shots, all those big apparatchiks in Eastern Europe, they were celebrating the longevity, the infallibility of the communist system. A couple of months later, the Berlin Wall fell down. And all those big commies, they turned into big pro-Westerners, you know? I saw it firsthand with my eyes and my ears when I was a diplomat in communist Yugo, in, in Croatia. 
I would be happy if they listened now to learn to that. I had to shake hands literally with people who put my dad in jail in the 80s. My dad was a lawyer. He was adopted by Amnesty International, long story. And then when Yugoslavia fell apart, all those ancient former commies in Croatia, they all became very sturdy nationalists, you know, started backing me up on my shoulder. So today's ruling class in the system, I call this whole system, be it in San Francisco, Stuttgart, or you call it in, uh, or in, uh, or in uh, Sydney, or in uh, the European Union, does not know where it's headed and what to do next. Do not overestimate them, ladies and gentlemen. Again, do not estimate, overestimate those big heads in the European Commission. Some of them Nick knows better than I do, but some of them I know also. The system is much weaker than it wishes to show, and one must neither overestimate its self-declared strength nor forget its inborn fragility. I'd like to thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen.